Hello and welcome to Streaming Media West Connect, the final session on day three. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the conference chair for Streaming Media West Connect. And uh, under normal conditions, we would be meeting in Huntington Beach, but as we all know, there's nothing normal about anything right now. And so we're doing what we can, meeting virtually like everyone else. And of course, the advantage there is that people who might not be able to attend in person can hopefully attend online and speak online as well. Uh, we've had a great week of panels and presentations so far, everything from deep technical dives into things like CMAF and WebRTC and live production to big picture panels looking at esports and sports streaming and OTT from all different angles. And of course, this one coming up on advertising technology. All of these sessions will be made available on demand on the Streaming Media YouTube page. They should be posted by early middle of next week. So check out streamingmedia.com, click on videos and click on conference videos to find those. Things continue next week with the Content Delivery Summit, summit on Monday and several in-depth workshops for the rest of the week. So we've got another almost full week of, uh, of content to bring you for Streaming Media West Connect. Before we go any further, I'd like to thank our platinum sponsor for Streaming Media West and that's Limelight Networks. Uh, here's a few words from that sponsor, Steve. At Limelight, we're in the business of connecting people to exceptional digital experiences. Our real-time edge platform has launched and grown some of the largest video properties in the world. When there's a high traffic industry event via the internet, the chances are we're helping deliver it. The difference? Limelight's global private network puts content and applications right next to your customers at the network edge. This result is the most dynamic real-time interactions, no matter where your customers are or what their business is. Like our network, we've also optimized our software stack to be fast, reliable, and secure. And our customers have unrestricted access to live regional technical support whenever it's needed. Limelight Networks has the capacity, the global footprint, and expert service worldwide needed to meet the growing demands for online content now and in the future. I would also like to thank the sponsor for this panel, Easy DRM, and Olga Kornienko from Easy DRM is joining the panel today. If you have any questions for our speakers, please submit them in the Q&A tab. Uh, you can put them in the chat, uh, but Q&A, make sure that we'll all be looking at them in this, or looking for them in the same place. If you raise your hand, we unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, are not going to be opening up the mics and cameras for everyone in the audience. So please, again, submit questions in the Q&A tab. Now, at Streaming Media East Connect, we had a great discussion that Nadine Krepitz moderated on OTT workflows. And we were, I think we were surprised at how many of the questions came in about advertising technology. So we decided it was a great time to have a discussion devoted specifically to streaming media ad tech. And Nadine uh, likes to call herself SSAI girl. And uh, she's the perfect person to lead that discussion. And so to jump into a discussion about streaming media ad tech relationship advice. Here's Nadine Krefitz, who is a streaming media contributor, and she will introduce our all-star panel, Nadine. So uh, yes, I am surfer side ad insertion girl. My special power is being able to actually understand and explain some of the ad tech stuff you need to know about. And I've got a great panel here today, and we are going to cover a lot of stuff. We're gonna start off with some of the terminology that's used, just in case you're not up to date on it. Um, but first, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves and let's go in order of the listing, which makes Larry come first. Larry, why don't you say who you are and what you do in terms of ad tech? Thanks, Nadine. Hi, everybody. Uh, Larry Allen, GM and uh, VP of Addressable Enablement at Comcast Advertising. Uh, we're basically working to empower national programmers to deliver and convert their 14 minutes of linear time to addressable. Uh, within our footprint, uh, as well as VOD addressable enablement as well. Cool. Very good. Thank you so much. Jeremy, you are next up. Uh, yeah, so Jeremy Brown, and I'm Video Delivery Associate Director at Optusport, uh, previously at major broadcasters in Australia as well. Uh, I 
specialize in server side ad insertion and video in my video delivery role, addressable for VOD and live, um, scaling for some pretty big live events, uh, delivering VOD across lots of devices as well. All right, very good. Let's see, we have Jared next. Jared, you are with? Uh, Viacom CBS, uh, SVP Global Video Monetization and Operations, so oversee uh, sales process, trafficking, ad tech, uh, vendor relationships, you know, when it comes to traditionally the legacy uh, CBS Interactive side of the business. Okay. Yasmin. Hi, I'm Yasmin. I work with Kate's Broadcasting and I handle digital platform management. I work in conjunction with our network ops team and our ad tech team to make sure the ads get served into our live streams. Okay. And finally, Olga. And you are on mute, just like I was yes. earlier. I'll unmute. Um, hi, everybody. I am Olga Kornienko. I'm the co-founder and CEO of um, Easy DRM. We are a DRM or a security company. And I know that DRM is not a typical thing that goes with ads, but maybe we should start thinking about the idea of securing content and ads to make sure that it is beneficial for the businesses and we protect the business models and revenues. Okay, so we're going to go back way to the beginning. And at one point, um, we did a planning call, and Jared, you mentioned this was an open ecosystem. Can you explain that for us? Uh, you know, the, the foundation, I think, of how we all trade and execute today, whether it's client side or server side, uh, is based off of uh, the IAB specs. So VMAP and VAST which you know, have numerous versions against it, but at the, at the very least the buy side, the sell side and the technology that sits in between, that is the common language that we all execute on regardless of how we actually do it, but that is the foundation of, uh, of the ecosystem. Okay, hold that thought. There's so much there I wanna kind of, we'll quickly go to some terms and then get back to that. Um, you know, first up is when some people talk about ad tech, they talk about, being frame accurate. Larry, what does that mean? Yeah, so in a live linear environment, um, it's very important when an ad is getting inserted into the stream for it to be frame accurate so that the, you don't get frames of black or overlaying or clipping of your ads in the pod. And so it's actually really important um, in the live environment uh, to, to be frame accurate so that you provide a great consumer experience. Okay, all right. Got that. Now, of course, this panel often used to be called SSAI, but Jared, sorry, Jared answered kind of the question earlier as to what it's an open ecosystem for. Um, Jared, what is server-side ad insertion? Uh, there's a YouTube video of me doing this for the IAV a couple of years ago. Uh, Google it. It's I'll put my kid voice on. But basically, server-side ad insertion is uh you know you request your advertisements in the cloud um and you are stitching those responses back with your content so to the end user it is one stream they're not going from you know stream one to stream two to stream three it is, it is one continuous playback and it is a tv like experience okay and there's a couple of benefits to the server side kind of aspect of it um we'll go with you have uh less development in terms of customizing for each platform. You've got the ability to kind of trick the ad blockers into just seeing one stream. And you of course have the TV like experience, but um, we also have other things that we're gonna discuss, but Jeremy's gonna tell us what client side is since client side is the other thing that people do. What is client side, Jeremy? The, um, the other one. Okay, so client other. side, <laughs> client side ad insertion. Um, before a video actually starts, there's an SDK that sits on top of the player. It's typically Google's IMA SDK. Um, you have to install it onto every single app. Uh, it will make a request for VMAP. We talked about VMAP already. Um, so during playback, when we get to these timed breaks, the SDK will take over the content player and let its own player fetch ads and man manage, manage the impressions, the handling, the measurability metrics. So it's almost like a player on top of a player and they're fighting for your attention. Okay, so we've got 
the player wars here. That's possibly another panel, but um, we are going to tie this all together. Believe me, just stick with us here. So Yasmin, third party validation, what is that? So um, third party validation basically verifies that your ad is reaching the correct audience. So generally what happens is in the ad that gets served to you, there's a little bit of code that checks the environment that it's landing in. So it looks for um, site, browser, content of the, of the site or the app, and then it returns that back to the ad validation company who then spits out a report for the advertisers to make sure that they are getting their money's worth. Okay. So essentially it's how the media companies get paid, really. Yes. Cool. All right. And let's see here, Olga, we've got why should DRM matter to this panel? So why? Yeah, I know it's, it's a tricky one, right? Um, well, DRM is just a technology, just like anything else we're talking about here. And this is a technology that is used to support the business that we're in. And um, if you can't sustain a stream or if you can't, can't sustain the revenue from the stream, be it ad driven or anything else, uh, there's really no point to running a business. So DRM would help you sustain both, if you will. Okay, cool. And like I said, we're gonna still st stitch this all together. I tell terrible streaming jokes, um, but there's latency, no. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Yasmin, Scuddy, what's Scuddy? So Scuddy for us in, in the ad world is the, we're really talking about the Scuddy marker. It's uh, a timed metadata that gets added to your stream. And basically it's a timestamp and a duration. And that's how we delete what a pod or a segment should be. So with the timestamp, you, you create a, a starting uh, SCUDI marker. The duration tells you how long that window is gonna be. And then you uh, stick a ending SCUDI marker on it. And we use that to serve the ads. Okay, we're gonna have a test here. You're, we're gonna ask you all in the audience what these terms mean. Uh, the next term, VAST and VPAID, V-A-S-T, VPAID, V-P-A-I-D. Jeremy, what does that mean? So VAST is simply the, the XML format standard, the IAV that we talked about before. That the, mm -hmm. they, they, they work as a set of instructions for the player to understand what format uh, formats of the video are available to pick from uh, and when to trigger URLs to to track impressions, track error codes, uh, track measurement. Um, that's fast. VPay, I believe, is a hot mess. Um, we moved away from Flash uh, a long time ago. Um, and as we moved away, we had an interactive layer. Um, and so we needed to replace that with a, So that's where VPay was initiated from. Uh, it allowed us to interrupt the player um, and put a interactive ad over the player. And that worked really well in a, in a website, but obviously over time, running other people's code, running other people's websites over your player, um, that's a security issue, probably. Um, you know, it's raising concerns around GDPR and tracking, things like that. So we're seeing less and less, and we're not actually seeing as many interactive ads as we probably planned for. Sorry, I'm going a little bit long. But <laughs> what we are, what we, are um, we are still seeing VPAID used to sideload uh, SDKs for measurability, like viewability. Um, but being that it's so limited in, in implementation to web, it's, it's not looking great going forward. Um, I'm keen to see OMSDK and other measurement take over. Okay, I promise this is gonna tie into something. And like I said, there will be a test. But Larry, open measurement, what does that mean? Yeah, really that's enabling the programmers and the advertisers to aggregate information across all of the places where their ads are running and develop metrics around reach, incremental reach, frequency of their advertising, being able to duplicate and understand kind of audiences where they're actually expo being exposed to ads. And so, you know, it's really an important component for how the ecosystem is, is going to evolve and, you know, be managed, you know, in, in a similar fashion to how linear TV is measured today in the panel, but this is really done under the census basis. Okay, there's one last thing here that's a tech part of this. And I've got pixels, why are pixels used? And that's a Jared question. Uh, so that's how just 
the mechanics of tracking get done. So as Jeremy said, you know, you have a vast response, which will have a tracker for the start, 25, 50, 75, 100% events. Those URLs are pixels. So okay. you call the URL and some, the other end of that server, you know, records a hit, or an impression or an event. Uh, and that's how we all transact. Okay. All right. So think of this as having been your dictionary for a bunch of the ad tech terms. I'll go, I wanted just to ask you why, um, if DRM causes latency, since that's kind of part of what people perceive. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, DRM actually does not cause latency in any player, in any environment. Once the content starts to download, you will um, have a player request a license at the same time. So especially so vital to live, um, it would not cause any latency at all because a player should be able to handle both downloading of the license and downloading of the uh, content at the same time. Okay, we've got all these terms now, so let's put them all together. So, um, you know, one of the things that I wanna do is get people's preference on whether they prefer server side, client side, combination, something entirely different. I'm gonna start off, and in fact, I haven't actually warned Yasmin yet. Yasmin, I'm gonna start off with you and ask you, what's your preference and why? Uh, so, obviously we are, uh, we're more like, we, we are a, a broadcast, a group of broadcast networks. So I, mm -hmm. my preference is definitely SSAI. I like the pre-stitch, the, you know, no slate, all the, the niceties that come with in, you know, a, a well-delivered stream. Okay. How long have you guys been using SSAI? Do you remember? Uh, as long as I've been there. Okay. So that's about four years. All right. Okay. So uh, let's see who's next up here. Um, I think uh, I was going to go to Jeremy. And I think Jeremy's a fan. But Jeremy, what's your preference? Definitely a fan. So originally with the Apple TV first generation, the only way to get onto that platform was server side. So that really mm -hmm. triggered a a love for me on that. Once we'd done that, we rolled it into every other device. So okay. I think uh, we touched on a few benefits of service side. The other ones being that the, the video quality and the loudness uh, get, get um, as part of the transcoding step. So you've not just got a linear playback experience, but you've got one where you don't get those loud ads that you often get on other experiences. Um, it does okay. present more challenges than client side ads um, for the ad buyer, but uh, I think they've all come around. It's taken a few years, but they all get it. Well, you know, Jared, I'm going to ask you, but the thing is, is that I'll, it's, now it's a two-part question, is, you know, what's your preference? And do you think what Jeremy just said is is accurate to you guys? Whatever Jeremy says is wrong. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we never get along. I know, <laughs> I know. So I'm just, you know, flaming. Uh, so, fires. look, I think... For the most part, server-side ad insertion, without a doubt, is you know, I, I you know, TV-like experience because we all run TV. It has to work like TV. You know, it, it, that is the only that is the best way to achieve that. Mm -hmm. uh, certain executions, certain platforms, uh, you know, server-side might not make sense, and you and you have to do client-side. So you know, if you have your choice server side but there are plenty of scenarios where you can't do it and you got to do client side actual insertion i think the the distinction is where you do tracking and that's where you can really pivot and do a lot of different ways and you know the more tracking you could bring to the client the better uh, and that really comes you know platform and device specific on where you can get away with it you can't and what jeremy said is true server side ad insertion let you normalize audio because none of us like having loud or soft ads that make you not have a TV like experience. You know, I have so many questions just to follow up, but you know, I feel like we should kind of stay on the stream of we, what we've planned out, but I'm going to get back to you. So Larry, what about you? Is it server or client? What's your preference? Yeah, no, I, I agree with everybody. Uh, server side is, is the right way to go given the kind of consumer experience that we're all managing to. Um, you know, TV has set an expectation, and I think 
now with all of the streaming platforms, we have to have the same high quality experience that, that you had gotten in a broadcast environment. So server side is the way to go. Okay. So it seems like we're all drinking the server side admission Kool-Aid here. And, um, you know, I, Olga, if, you're a little bit different than the group here, but you know, for you, where do you do you integrate with both server side and client side within the workflow? Uh, well, you know, the first question is for me: Do I prefer it as a uh, as a consumer? And that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> but um, from a tech perspective, I we are indifferent. Um, an ad is just another video file that can be called whenever and. Mm -hmm. So completely indifferent to us, which way you go. Okay. All right. Now, without warning, Jared, you brought up a bunch of things. So let's continue <laughs> the conversation. So uh, you said some platforms can't support. So what happens when you have a platform that can't support it? What are you doing? Uh, so where you can't do server-side ad insertion, and this really, I think, is going to touch base a little bit more, I think, in Larry's world, when mm -hmm. in certain industry groups that are up and coming, or at least as, as we're thinking of addressable on um, linear live feeds on sorry, something like Project Or in the States, that is an example of client-side ad insertion in that mm -hmm. you're layering video on top of video. So that is that is a client-side one. You know, if it was server-side, it would, you know, what traditional TV has been for since it started. That is server-side ad insertion. You're stitching it somewhere and that's you're not doing anything muxing or messing with anything on the client. So that's one example of you know where client side ad insertion is, is a requirement. You can't do server side. Okay. So um, client, you know, it, it, I don't know why this is like a world of acronyms. I still think it's more they've got more acronyms in ad tech than anywhere else. So project or and you say laying video on top of video. So essentially what you're doing, you're saying two players. Uh, I, I am not going to get the tech elements right of it and they'll probably okay. kill me, but it's essentially a, you're, you're layering a video on top of an underlying stream. So, and you can think okay. of it as it's two point there, uh, you go, Jeremy. Jeremy, what do you want to say, Jeremy? So definitely you can layer in HTML5 and some of the other platforms, but what we're finding with TVs is they hand over to a native player and you don't get that ability. So anyone who's looked at an old, uh, older apps that run client-side ads, uh, you, you'll see that buffering, that time spent between the content and the ad. Um, that's that's what we're trying to address. But I don't think that's what Project Or is. I get the sense that that's, yeah. You okay, I'm gonna- preloaded the ad in the middle into the player. Okay, I'm gonna first take a break from this conversation and go to a, a question that we have from the audience. So can you share a scenario that cannot use server side. So we we just started to talk about this, but um, you know, for any of you, and uh, you get to kind of jump into this. What, where is the, the the obvious thing? So some of you have mentioned. I won't put words in your mouth. A couple of you have mentioned things in the past. What comes to mind? Um, who wants to talk first? Just one. I'm going to say randomly. One of you grab it. And one of you has to grab it or I assign it. Yasmin's joking. All right, all right, He's laughing. All right, I'll, okay. <laughs> all right. I'll say so look, there there are there might be a video gaming system that mm -hmm. because of how closed captions need to be supported, okay, might prevent you from doing server side ad insertion. So there are nuances in certain things, or DRM is a perfect example where, you know. DRM and server side, sometimes, you know, the device, you know, depending on if you're on Dash or HLS or whatever you got to do, like, there's a lot of variations that need to go together for a stream to work. And in some cases, ad, the ad ecosystem doesn't play nice with the content ecosystem. So you, you might have to divorce yourself from server side and move to the client because of certain combinations on certain devices might not do this, might do that. Um, I, a lot of those are getting solved every day, but they still exist and older hardware just can't do it. And you have to do things separately. Okay. I have a message here that comes from, from um, Victor who says, if you want interactive ads, you can't do server side insertion. Do you guys yes, you agree can. with that? Yes, no. you can. Okay. I like to have like random fights here. So why? You can, so you're saying. 
You can. Uh, okay. So I simid, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, on one of the IAB specs where you, your underlying <laughs> video is stitched. It's almost think of it as the new companion ad. You can have an additional JavaScript that might work on a Roku or a TVOS or something like that, that mm -hmm. you can layer on top of the base video where you can have interactive elements that or that overlay that appears and you could use your remote to pop it open and it might pause the stream and then you have a panel to play a game, choose pictures and stuff like that. Um, we actually did it in the Super Bowl two years ago. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, it's doable. yeah I've, I've seen these examples. Um, I don't think there's a standard. Uh, I think a standard would be a bad thing in this situation, but I definitely have seen uh, some of the bigger uh agencies having a similar product like that where they you've loaded into a ctv you could, as part of the interactivity uh during the ad it can have these it's just web you can do okay. all, any, whatever, whatever you can do with web you can pretty much do on the tv most of the tvs now so we have a lot of questions coming in i'm glad that's great we have a bit of a planned program so i'm gonna i'm gonna get back to one of these questions um just because i want to cover a, a number of topics here um that are still very relevant for people to talk about. And the privacy thing is, is the next topic we were just going to jump to. And, you know, I've got, the question is, what does life look like without cookies? And Yasmin, you and I have talked about this. Um, so how do you track or target when you need to get people's approval for PPI? So, oh. Yeah, to to your first question, how does life look like without cookies? It's very bleak, but oh. <laughs> um, so I, I guess therein lies the rub, right? You know, you have to ask for the PPI in order to be able to to really track somebody and serve them appropriate ads across devices. Mm -hmm. So if you can't do that, you're just kind of shooting an arrow in the dark, you know, generally the idea, the consensus idea seems to be that, you know, if you can get somebody to you know, give you permission to drop that advertising tracking cookie or to provide you an email address that you can then anonymize, then you can use that with your ad tracking and carry it across everywhere where, where they're, you know, consuming content. Uh, without that, I'm not quite sure. I'd love to hear what the other guys have to say about that too. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I, I think I get Larry first. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, I think it's why you're seeing this rush for m almost all the media companies to move D to C, where they're building a direct relationship with consumers, and so then they have an ability to do that linkage and build a household graph across their footprint, um, and partnering with other. Uh, platforms that also have direct consumer relationships. So, you know, our business, you know, we have, you know, 25 million subscribers. We have the ability to match to those households um, across device types. So that's in the, you know, in our set-top box environment, but also within the apps that run on our platforms and apps that run on other people's platforms. So, you know, that is a really important thing. And I think um, the media companies are all actively building their own graphs and trying to, to drive you know, more consumer relationships where they're capturing email, home address, credit card, et cetera. Okay. All right. So, I mean, you're, you're in the, okay, Jeremy, you, Sorry, you uh, too. Yeah, both of you come cookie, from an environment cookie. with a lot of data. Yeah, so in a cookie-less environment, I guess I'm just saying I'm already there because of the server side. So if you think about how a cookie's created, it's a direct, direct request from a client to a service and that service could be anyone on the ad service ecosystem. Uh, when you put SSAI in the middle, you've, you've created a, almost a firewall between that, that transaction. Um, gets a bit murky when we talk about impressions and everything else, but the, 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 what, the way we've built out our stack is where we're working closely with the manufacturers on the resettable identifier technologies that they have. Um, as a, as a replacement. This is part of, I guess, where GDPR went. And, and so when you think of uh, Apple IDFA, Roku's RDID, Android AAID, Xbox MSID, these platforms, there's, there's your acronym soup. Um, I, I know. The, these, are, these are guys who have put the effort in to be compliant with those, with those standards. 
And so if you just lean on, the, on, their, on their technologies um, and their a resettable identifier, then you can, you, you know you're, you're following through. Obviously there's your own user data and, program and how that works, but the, the word cookie that, that is not even really a thing anymore for us. Yeah, especially okay. in video generally, right? Okay, it's, so wait. It is waning. Now, Yasmin, did you have any kind of follow-up that you wanted to mention to, to Jeremy? Just because I want to make sure that this is a conversation yeah, and not just <laughs> yeah. be, before I go to the next person here. I, I have nothing to refute there. I, okay. I mean, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> so. but, but Jared, what do you think? <laughs> uh, you know, look, I mean, cookies, I think you're like, the majority of our viewership, and in general, with video, you're always going to try to watch it on the best screen available. And when you're home, that's on a 55 plus inch TV that's either hooked up to an X1 box or a Roku or a TVOS, no cookies. Uh, mobile apps, when you're on the road, or, or when we all used to take the bus to train to work or whatever it was, you're on your phone, on an app, no cookies. Uh, so, and especially, you know, I think we started streaming video at CBS in 2006. It's migrated from a desktop browser experience to an app experience on phones and, and, and big TV. So that, that cookie-less environment, I think a lot of the major video infrastructure, the TV kind of access are used to, and it comes back to the device ID, the resettable privacy safe device IDs that are available. And I think to Larry's point, pointing to boxes. Um, uh, he's also spot on in that, you know, the logged in user, the subscriber, is the next iteration of identity. And, and knowing who that user is, who that family is, as you have profiles, and who's watching, you know, it's not just like, you know, uh, you know, my wife's the tech guru of the company, you know, of, of the household or the company. I'm like, now I'm home, it's the company. Um, she's the one that sets up the Netflix account or the, the CBS All Access account or, you know, something along those lines. So now I'm a, you know, woman, 25, 54, and it's me watching Game of Thrones. So, you know, those profiles are even going to become more important in the years as we get more relevant advertising to who we believe is watching the content. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm not even going to ask you what kind of ads you're seeing, because I already know. Um, <laughs> Olga, let's go on to security. <laughs> you know, I think that, you know, we talked about this. Uh, so what are the key areas of the ad tech workflow where security issues could put revenue streams at risk? And, and we're talking live or AVOD. So we we'll throw it open to you since we want to keep you into the conversation, too. Sure, thank you. I uh, appreciate that. I actually was curious about... Um, Jared's earlier comment where he said that he's having issues with DRM and server side, which from everything I know about the, the, the infrastructure, um, maybe it's because the encoder isn't keeping up, but basically server side is where DRM works swimmingly and perfectly with um, ad tech because it's being fed into the stream. Yes, Jared. So Here's, so the challenges we've seen as we're doing server-side ad insertion, and we get a little technical, or I'll get technical, whatever, it's, we are tech, in a tech conference. Um, the ad chunk, the, the content chunks are DRM protected and good to go. The advertising segments are coming from a different CDN, mm -hmm. are not DRM protected. So as you switch between DRM, not DRM, DRM, not DRM, on certain devices, it crashes. It doesn't handle it well. So as you're switching back and forth, and where are you on Dash? Are you doing period? Are you Dash period? Are you doing HLS? Those different flavors, and as, as you switch between DRM and not DRM, is where you have issues. So why is so why, that? Why is say, there? Why not DRM the ad? Uh, it's, the, it's not just the DRM, but it's the multiple periods and the player support. Obviously, multi-period dash is a complicated monster um, that some some of the CTVs were built before these things were really being used in the wild as as they are today. So it, 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 it's 
it's like a multiplying effect. Like if you want to make something hard, put multiple periods on it. If you want to make it even harder, put DRM on the content. If you want to make it even harder, put DRM on the content, keep the content and the ads clear. So now isn't right, that something could... that is, it changes as new devices come out? My well, and also, you know, a lot of work on the topic is being done in uh, like the Dash IF where once these issues are brought up, Dash IF, uh, takes a look at it and for anybody, sorry, we didn't define that Dash IF is the Dash Industry <laughs> Forum, Nadine, sorry. Um, the da uh, Dash IF takes a look at it and works on standards to see what makes things easier and how to make it more seamless. But at the end of the day, it's if you're looking at a case where somebody is stealing your content and then putting somebody else ads in, what's the point of running a business model when you're putting in all this effort to produce all of this content and just, just to give it away to somebody else for free and have them plug in ads where they're possibly running fake ad, um, making fake ad revenue because they have all these bots generating all of this fake traffic and charging all sorts of money. I mean, it's, it's a whole vicious circle where DRM would just prevent a good chunk of those problems. Okay. And right now, I, um, I'm trying to prevent fights from breaking out here. <laughs> I mean, like the real fights where we're fighting with each other. So, um, and I am also definitely trying to get us to move through a lot of the just issues because there's a lot, a lot of stuff here. And so we've already covered a bunch. We covered like a bunch of acronyms. And, you know, I want to kind of pause on the DRM stuff for a minute and go back to SCUDDY. So I'm going to go to Larry and um, the question is, how do you keep your study straight through the workflow and why is this important? So you got to tell us. Oh man, but it's, a, it's complicated. So, you know, programmers use the study triggers as Yasmin was saying to basically identify the beginning and end of ad breaks and the individual ads that are going to be inserted. There's additional data that can be sent with the study trigger to you know, specifically call out specific advertisers. Um, traditionally, people are using the SCUDDY triggers to delineate between the national inventory and the kind of local or distributor inventory that's often shared in carriage agreements. Um, and that's very much a kind of local national setup. But now as we're moving into addressability and we're working to enable consistently enable national inventory to also be insertable within these kind of local systems or um, digital CTV systems. There's new study triggers that are being developed that are on different tiers so that they can be listened to, listened for differently by each of the endpoints and delineate specific endpoints um, so that the programmer has more control over what ads get triggered and when um, and where within their feed, and so that the kind of distributor who is distributing that programmer's content can understand it and then match the advertising to the appropriate households and do the appropriate decisioning to do the insertion of the replacement ads. Okay, so we got a bunch of stuff here, and um, Yasmin, where do you want to jump in on this? Like, you know, are there questions you have? Are you agreeing with him? Do you have specific issues in your workflow that comes up with SCUDDY? Uh, so, obviously these guys, I mean, they live and breathe this. I play on the outskirts of all of this ad tech. So I don't have too much to, you know, negate uh, whenever they speak. But I, I can't say that, at least for me, the issues that I've seen as far as uh, integration generally deal with legacy devices. Um, you know, we'll, we'll deliver a stream and everything will be listed in the manifest just fine. But, you know, for some reason we have, we'll be working with older devices that require an, an earlier version of, you know, whatever it is that we're delivering. And then, um, and so then, you know, we end up having to create like multiple streams in order to you know, serve the whole consumer base of whatever platform we're trying to onboard with. Um, is that just me? Is, do you guys have to deal with that too? Um, I've got a, a kind of 
reference to Jeremy dealing with Scuddy. So Jeremy, Scuddy? Yeah, so uh, the addressability is obviously down to the user and that's where there's a, a great amount of uh, value, but the understanding what's on right now, what program is on right now, it's very difficult in a live environment. So you've got to work with broadcaster hardware and systems to bring that de detailing back. So the example I always give is the Super Bowl because I used to stream it. Um, it sometimes ran late and sometimes finished hours early. And it, in Australia, we play it in the middle of the day because uh, of time zones. And what goes on after is a cooking show. And so if you were buying inventory at, for two, at 12 o'clock on a Wednesday morning, are you buying the Super Bowl or are you buying a cooking show? So that's where part of this study is so important is to understand actually what's being played out. This is the Super Bowl truck, by the way. So I'm just going to say this is me sitting in the Super Bowl truck two years okay. ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you want, I mean, I have, I can pile on on Scuddy if you want me to pile on on it. Uh, sure. Give us your thoughts on Scuddy. Uh, like, it's hard to change and it's a difficult spec to deal with. And I think as you're dealing with multiple endpoints, some are mm -hmm. old, some are new. Um, and the, that, the spec itself is, is not uh, very flexible. So, and then there's a lot of business rules built on top of SCUDI. Um, so even just like getting the SCUDI trigger out of your broadcast center is a challenge upon itself. It containing the right metadata, as Jeremy was saying, is another challenge. And then all the downstream impacts of it. It's like, oh, I'm going to put a SCUDI trigger on something, but is it a national ad and I need to use it for dynamic ad insertion? Is it a uh, a local ad for an affiliate? Is it a local time for an MVPD? You know, it's like all the people that rely on this one single trigger that goes out um, and changing it is you're, you're, you're really like flapping your wings in, in, the, in, the, in the Sahara and causing a hurricane in Florida. Um, it, it takes a long time to move the ship and, and, and change how you use that trigger. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a break and go to some questions from the audience. because We've got a lot of them. So let's just hit up the first one. So what are some of the initiatives to standardize SSAI metadata in HLS and dash streams? Example of SSAI metadata, add position and duration, add click through URL, companion add URL, track events, if any, which ones are promising? Is that something that one of you kind of thinks you want to speak to in a short manner. I'm going to go with none of you. I talk yes. a lot, but I'll take this one as well. So I guess the IAB bar Briefly. standard is, is there for this, but okay. uh, the 4.0, 4.1 standards brought in mezzanine format, brought in um, links to OM SDKs, really tried to emphasize the importance of SSAI and, and, and the, the, what was missing, I guess, at one point. Okay. All right. Here's a, a totally different kind of question, but this is an advice column, so to speak. So um, we've got an industry question and I'm going to go with, uh, well, I won't, I won't assign this. I'll let you guys jump on it if you'd like. Industry question in general, how much does it cost a provider if, ad, ad, if ads aren't delivered properly? What is the potential revenue loss to an operator? A reference to a figure would help. Well, I don't think we're going to do figures because it's just so oh. different. I heard a noise. You, a all, noise? If you all. screw it up, you lose all the money. <laughs> you lose all the money. Okay. We, we won't give out a specific number, but you're losing the money if the ad doesn't run. So what happens? Why? Okay. We've touched on this before, but we're looking at just-in-time packaging. So what happens to the ad? The first time it runs, Larry, you have a new ad. What happens to it? Well, in some cases, it doesn't play because it hasn't been downloaded depending on the device that it's being played on, mm -hmm. um, which is obviously a problem um, if, there, if there isn't a possibility to do some sort of replacement or have a default that can deliver in its place. Um, and also bad user experience. You know, flax slate is not good. Um, and unfortunately, that still happens far too much within the CTV environment. Um, not always for technical reasons, sometimes because of demand issues or okay. lack of demand. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm now going to take a break from our 
questions and go a little bit back to our original programming. Um, and, and the reason is because this is something that Larry brought up in our planning meeting. And we talked about forcing digital to look at standardizing ads. So um, we have an issue in digital where you've got a lot of different pieces, right? And so Larry, if you want to continue talking about this, I know Larry and, and Yasmin both had some thoughts about, you know, why are standardizing ads important? And, and what does that mean even? Well, I mean, I think from a consumer experience standpoint, I always come back to this. Um, you know, the consumer has an expectation and in desktop environments, we kind of allow the advertisers and the agencies to run wild. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there weren't really good creative policies. Um, okay. the, the publishers didn't really audit the ads. In many cases, they were coming from multiple third-party hops way down the line where you didn't even know what ads were getting inserted when in the website. Um, but in, in streaming and in live linear, um, there's a whole policy process around what ads can run, competitive separation, the volume issue is a big one, you know, that we want to control for the encoding process. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, getting to a place where there is a, cre a standard creative distribution process that hits all of the quality standards, checks all the boxes with regard to policy, um, and allows those creatives to play on the various endpoints. You know, you have to transcode the creative to multiple um, standards in order to play on all devices. Um, that's a workflow and a process that um, certainly needs to be hardened now that you know, streaming and the number of streaming devices is scaling and, and actually having scale from a volume standpoint. Okay. No longer a, you know, a game, a true game anymore. So standards and standard, Yasmin, to you, what does what a standardizing it mean for you? Is, is it on the, the duration, the size? What, like, what is standardizing? What types are needed? So for me, uh, if standardizing were added to the delivery of ads, um, I think it would require uh, some sort of level of of improved quality. I mean, you know, for for digital, we just kind of, you know, serve what, you know, we want to serve or what we think mm -hmm. is going to, you know, throw it on the wall and it's going to stick with the consumer. But as far as, uh, you know, getting streams onto, you know, new platforms like, uh, you know, Peacock and the Roku channel, they are, they are, um, they are, wrong word, I don't want to say that word because that sounds very negative they are recommending that you comply with their length of, you know, ad pod duration. So uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it, uh, but I think Peacock has a uh, five, five minute limit per hour that they've committed to. Well, depending on the type of channel that you, that you're broadcasting, you know, if you're trying to take a linear broadcast into their digital platform, you're probably running more than five minutes per hour. So then the issue becomes, well, what do you cut off? Do you cut off some of your content? Do you, you know, cut off some of the ads that you, you know, promised you would serve? Um, it's kind of um, makes it makes it difficult to, you know, really decide what it is that you want to. Um, put out there and where you put the priority. Okay, all right. So I'm, I'm gonna go to Olga, but actually before I go to Olga, give me one second, it's another commercial break. Jared, did you have something that you wanted to mention? Cause I kind of thought this might be a topic that you too had some comments on. Yeah, I mean, I, I put this in the bucket, like creative distribution and like in the digital ecosystem, if we could all just get the same asset that goes to the TV ecosystem, a lot of our problems would go away. And I think, okay. you know, look, and this is where like VAS 4.0, we made the first attempt to make the mezzanine file as part of the spec. And, you know, bring, you know, at least in the United States, but even globally, the, you know, standards around metadata about the advertisement. So in the US, it's ad ID. Uh, in the UK, it's the clear, it's clear ID. There's another, there's another identifier in the UK. So even like just the notion of like that we're trying to standardize. Um, but then you start getting into, like as Larry said, you know, audio normalization, you know, you know, 
these things are playing on 70 inch screen TVs. So getting a, you know, a four by three letterboxed asset that got encoded 10 times before it ever makes it into a digital tag, it just looks mm -hmm. like crap. It doesn't look, it looks like amateur hour, which I think, you know, where we need to be better than that. And I think there's a lot of strides coming in, you know, at, you know, uh, you know, at the enterprise level. And I think, you know, some of those practices of, of, of acting like TV, I think are starting to make its way into the programmatic ecosystem, which I think is probably the biggest sore point on a lot of this stuff, because you can't police it. You have no idea what's going on. There's thousands of creatives flying around. Um, and, you know, people always put the, the focus on, this is my 30 seconds. I just want to make sure I get a, the, the right CPM and probably the right user. But not what does the ad look like um, to that end user? And I think that's where I hope as we progress and kind of you know put our big boy pants on, as as Larry said, when it comes to what we do, that those kind of infiltrate all the aspects of the trading ecosystem. Okay. All right. There is so much more we can talk about on this one. I'm trying to kind of get us on to a number of different things, but you know, one of the other questions that came in from the audience is about DRM. So from a cost saving perspective, someone wrote, people don't DRM ads. Is it correct? And so I'll, obviously I'll go, this is a question for you. Now, is it correct that they, that's an interesting question. Is it correct that they don't DRM it from a perspective of cost saving or is that a correct approach? I mean, yes, the DRM pricing is usually based on a license. So um, if you are doing a separate license, a separate key for DRM ads, yes, that would drive pricing up. No argument about that. Okay. Uh, if you don't do a separate key, if you don't switch keys for DRM, then chances are it would probably not drive cost at all because it's not in your license. Um, having said that, is that a correct approach to things? I would say no, granted as a DRM provider, but still, um, because it would eliminate a lot of, it would eliminate fraud. It would, one of the things that I didn't, we didn't get to, I think in this conversation is reporting, because uh, that would probably ah. help with um, reporting of, um, keeping track of the, whether or not an ad actually played because you can't crop it out and thus it would be beneficial to the ad use, to the ad provider to actually keep the ads in and know that nobody cropped them out. Nobody took a stream and went chop, chop, chop and then put somebody else's ads in. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, may not be the best approach. Okay. All right. Now, you know, there's only a few minutes left and we still have so many questions. And I also want to make sure that we've addressed everything that you guys want. Um, I'm going to go with Jared first. And, and Jared, my question is, is there anything else you want to ask the group here since we're all here together today and we're being nice to each other? Somewhat. Uh, uh, <laughs> questions or comments? See, questions well, or comments? Of course I'm putting on the spot. I'm putting all of you on the spot. <laughs> That's why you're here. And, and so realistically, the reason why I'm putting you on the spot is that you've got people from different groups here and you think about the fact that there's certain things that they've mentioned here. I mean, you started off talking about, you know, how this is um, really the open ecosystem. Do you want to kind of follow up in terms of what? All right. Okay, that's fair. All right. So it's open from a technology standpoint. I think, mm -hmm. you know, this is probably, you know, as, as Larry lives this a lot and think just the general, like the business ecosystem of TV is the most complicated wider spider web we'll ever encounter. And how we transact, how a programmer and a distributor, and now you have a third element on top of it, a device manufacturer. So you have like three layers of like, own, the, owning the user in, in that case. Um, and, and I don't I know if it's more of a comment, it's not a question, but it's like how we all work together to, at the end of the day, provide the best user experience because, mm -hmm. you know, identity might be three layers, it might be three layers above you as a programmer, or you might have it and they don't have it, or they have it, you don't have it, and how you trade on that and how, how you then use that 
to get relevant advertising to the end user to one, have a good user experience and then to provide your advertiser or client the ROI that they want on like they're marketing for a reason. They want someone to buy a product and you want to prove it and get better at making that more efficient for them. And then how, but how you navigate the three headed monster between, you know, on the business side on how you do these agreements um, is, and you is going to get actually more complicated. And I think you recently saw it in the press with NBC and Roku recently. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's, you know, that's the next level of carriage agreement and, and those kind of fights. And it's just gonna, it's, it's gonna get more difficult as time goes on. Okay, so this is not getting any simpler. Larry, you know, we quickly, what kinds of things do you think about when you kind of- Yeah, I mean, Jared touched on a couple of things. Um, interoperability mm-hmm. is, is a key one for me. I think about it a lot. We talk about it uh, with the team every day, um, making sure that the programmers and the advertisers, frankly, have a um, scaled opportunity across all of these devices. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there, there is a lot of fragmentation and there are still these kind of business impediments based on how you've negotiated with a platform or how some of the platforms are holding their data back. Um, you know, your content could run inside of YouTube TV, but if YouTube doesn't grant you rights to the user data on their platform, then you're limited to how much you're gonna be able to leverage that inventory and sell it. And that ultimately could lead to a bad user experience because either it goes black slate because you didn't sell it at all, or you're selling it dirt cheap. And then that creates downward pricing pressure on inventory elsewhere potentially. So, you know, there's some complications there for sure, but interoperability ultimately at the end of the day, all these things need to work together so you can decision across them in a unified manner. We have, we have so little time and, and I want to get everybody there, but you know, we're all good. Can you quickly comment to what you wanted to say here in terms of your thoughts? You're on mute. So unmute first. Sorry. That's keep okay. Forgetting. Um, so it's interesting listening to, you know, this conversation and people saying that it probably won't work. It has problems, blah, blah, blah. Well, you know what? Let's revisit this topic in a year. And I borderline dare somebody in this group to <laughs> run a uh, run DRM on a protected ad, service ad insertion, or client side I prefer service side. I think it's more logical, uh, especially that everybody's pulling to that topic in this group. But let's somebody do that, and okay. let's you know let's see what issues come up. But then you know let's figure this out. Okay, so she's, she's challenged you. Yasmin, we, we have like two minutes left. I want to get you and then Jeremy, you got a minute. What do you uh, think? I can do a minute. Yeah, so I guess we've been pretty clear today about the challenges. Service ID is the right way to go. There's no question and everyone's pretty much moved over. It's the only way to get on TV. It's the only way to get live insertion, we're correct. Okay. The, the challenges cool. are in the SCUDI. The challenges are on the player, especially as you move to connected TVs and consoles. But there, everyone, other people have addressed them. I have to cut you off because Jasmine, I want to make sure that we get everybody quickly talk because we're going to get cut off well, in a second. I really feel like this is the the world of the wild wild west. Uh, Jared spoke about you know the three different layers to provide a good customer experience. If you guys are listening, there's an opportunity out there for somebody to be like the the magical translator, the connect the dots person. If you can do it, there's money there. Okay. All right. So um, even though we won't get cut off, I still want to make sure that we end pretty close to when we're supposed to. There are still so many more questions left. We'll filter them to you guys. And as you can see, this is a topic that people just are fascinated by. Uh, It's complicated. These guys are experts. And, you know, Eric, what else do you have to say? Because you're here and you want to, you've been getting all the feedback and the questions, but I want to turn this back over to you and say thank you so much for letting me do this. And this is Server Side Ad Insertion Girl signing out. You're on mute, Eric. <laughs> mute. Of course I was. Yeah, I was busy <laughs> doing a screen capture of all the questions that you promised we would filter to our panelists, which we will do our best to do. We will. Uh, yes. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, everyone, for a great conversation. Obviously, it could have gone on much longer given all the questions that are there. It's clearly a subject that people have a lot of questions about and are very interested in. We'll revisit it, I'm sure, at the next streaming media event, wherever that takes place, online or in 
person. Okay. Um, so that wraps things up here. I'd like to thank EZDRM for sponsoring this panel. And I'd like to thank Limelight Networks for sponsoring Streaming Media West Connect on the whole. We've got two more sessions tomorrow, one on OTT monetization models and one on lessons learned in the COVID-19 crisis. So, okay. we'll see you so thank you, panelists. You were great. And uh, like I said, Eric will do this again with us. Thanks, Eric. Yes, I will. Okay. All right. All right. Thank Take you. care. Bye, guys.